Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. And this is our regular weekly message. And yesterday was Veterans Day. And I want to say thank you to each and every veteran out there. We appreciate you. Thank you so much for your service. May the Lord bless you richly. May he continue to pour into your life. Thank you, veterans. Today's message is entitled, I Desire Mercy. It's not God's desire to judge and to condemn, but rather it is his desire to love and forgive. It's his desire to extend mercy to each one of us and then for us to extend mercy to each other. Our God is a God of mercy. We can't earn it. He freely gives it to us. Why? Because he is a good, good God. He loves us that much. Please turn with me to our scripture reading found in Matthew chapter 9, verse 9 through 13. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. This is Jesus' first time quote in Hosea, but it won't be his last. The judgmental, self-righteous Pharisees saw that Jesus was eaten with many tax collectors and many sinners. They became enraged to see him reclining at the table and communing with them, talking with them. Maybe Jesus was even laughing with them. So they began to whisper. They began to gossip. They began to spread false doubts about Jesus. But in response, Jesus instructs them like this. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Matthew chapter 9 verse 13. Jesus was quoting Hosea which says in Hosea chapter six, verse six, for I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. That's the ESV, the English Standard Version. Hosea uses the Hebrew word hesed, which is often translated steadfast love, but is also translated as mercy, kindness, as well as loyalty. The King James Version, for example, translates it mercy as in, for I desired mercy and not sacrifice and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. You see, it's not God's desire to pass judgment on us, although he will and he does pronounce judgment. Still, it is not God's desire to pronounce sentence on offenders, but again, he will. It's not God's desire to bring judgment down upon the guilty, but he will because mankind will force him to do it. He is left with no choice sometimes, for we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Like Adam, we have transgressed the covenant. We have dealt faithlessly with our God and our feet have rushed to commit iniquities. Therefore, it is not God's desire to deal in judgment and in punishment, but in mercy. Even when he has no choice, God would rather be merciful, showing steadfast love, endless kindness to us instead of judgment. Look at what he said in Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30 and 31. 
And I sought for a man among them who would build up the wall and stand in the breach before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Therefore, I have poured out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. I have returned their own weight upon their heads, declares the Lord God. The people of Ezekiel's day was polluting the land by devouring human lives. They stole the wealth of the ordinary citizens. They killed husbands, creating widows. The priests were breaking God's law and profaning his holy things. They held nothing sacred. Everything was desecrated. They were shedding innocent blood and their preachers were telling them lies. They were robbing the poor, extorting the sojourner, and withholding justice from the people. In other words, it was pretty much like today. The same things are going on today in our world. Wickedness abounds and righteousness is suppressed. Justice is withheld from the people. But even in all of that, all of that rebellion, and in the midst of all that wickedness, God said in Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30 and 31, And I sought for a man among them who would build up the wall and stand in the breach before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Therefore, I have poured out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. I have returned their own weight upon their heads, declares the Lord God. God sought for a man before he would do anything, before he would bring judgment down upon the people. God sought for a man, just one man to stand in the gap, just one man to build up the wall so that he, the, the Lord of all gods, the God of gods, would not have to pour out his terrible wrath upon the people, but he found none. He looked to see, he looked to find, but he found none. There was not one man, there was not one person to stand in the gap, to fill the breach. No one to plead on behalf of his fellow citizens. God found none. Therefore, God had no choice but to pour out his indignation. He had no choice but to pour out the fire of his wrath and consume them with his burning anger. He returned their way upon their own heads and repaid them for their lewdness. But that was not his first choice. He desperately looked, he desperately sought to find someone, one man, one woman, one boy, one girl, somebody to fill the gap and intercede on behalf of the people. But he found none that was willing. That is why the scripture says in Psalms 136, verse 1 through 3, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, for His steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for His steadfast love endures forever forever. And it repeats for the next 22 verses, 26 verses in all. It states his steadfast love endures forever. Our God is a good, good God. Our God is a good, good father, not willing to pour out his indignation. That is not his desire. He is a kind and loving father, looking to bless and not to curse, looking to give hope and not take hope away. It is the enemy, the thief, it is Satan who comes to do that. John chapter 10, verse 10. 
Jesus says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus came to give us life and not just life, but life more abundantly. God does not want to hear you complaining about how horrible, how terrible another person is. He wants you to stand in the gap. He wants you to intercede for that person so that they are not consumed by his wrath. God is a consuming fire, but he does not want to pour out his indignation on people. He would rather see them come to repentance and gain eternal life. Look at the second time that Jesus refers to Hosea's quote. Matthew chapter 12, verse 7. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. Remember the first time when Jesus mentions this verse back in Matthew chapter 9, verse 9? He instructed his hearers to go and learn. Go and learn what this verse means. Apparently, those hairs did not do what Jesus instructed them to do. Go and learn what that verse meant. No, they did not. Because Jesus would not have later on said, if you had known. You see, Jesus wasn't just chewing the fat with those good old boys. He was giving them good advice, advice that they did not see as good, and they did not take it to heart. Therefore, they stood condemning the innocent. So they did not go and learn what that phrase meant. Instead, they repeated the same mistake again. Notice that this time Jesus says, if you had known what this means. He had sent them earlier to go and find out what it meant, but they refused to learn. They refused to do their homework, thus repeating the same mistake again and again. And that's how we are. We continuously repeat the same mistakes. Time after time, day after day, week after week, month after month, and year after year, we repeat the same mistake. I remember many years ago when I was in the military and I was young. One dark night I was driving home back to the base and I ran over something in the middle of the road. As I rounded that corner, my car <laughs> over something. I don't know what it was. So I drove down to the U-turn, I turned around and I went back. And I found the other U-turn and I came back. And as I neared that corner, I slowed down a little bit. And again, I hit that bump in the road. I ran over something. I do not know what it was. So I turned around and I went back because I was curious. I wanted to know what is this that I'm bumping over? And again, when I rounded that corner, I bumped over the same thing. I did this about three or four times to finally I just drove on because I did not seem to, or could not seem to find out what it was that I kept running over. So I gave up and went home. And that is how it is with us in the spiritual. We stumble over the same mistakes every time. Yet we turn around and we go back thinking, this time will be different than the last time. This time I will find out what it is. I will not stumble over the same things that I stumbled over last week. This time it will be different. But it's not. We stumble over the same things day after day, week after week. We say to ourselves, we will not stumble over the same mistake. And before we know it, we hit that same cement block in the road, that same stumbling block, that same thing that trips us up. We let it trip us up again. Then we point the finger at those who are making other mistakes, not the kind of mistakes that we're making, yet we pass judgment on those people. But God said that he desires mercy, 
not sacrifice. God desires to deal with us in mercy, but we don't deal in mercy with our fellow people, our fellow man. God desires for us to deal in mercy with each other, just like he is dealing in mercy with us. He does not want us to condemn each other, but rather he wants us to intercede for each other. He wants us to hold each other up in prayer and pray for each other. One man, one woman, one boy, one girl to stand in the gap. Even when Jesus was being crucified on the cross, Jesus did not raise one accusation against those who were mercilessly beating him. Those who pound the nails into his hands and drove the nails into his feet. But rather he lifted up his eyes and he looked to heaven and he lifted up his voice and he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Luke chapter 23, verse 24. Stephen, being stoned by the elders, being stoned by the scribes and the council, being stoned by the members of the synagogue of free men, likewise lifted up his voice and called out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. The same people that he should have been able to trust, the same people that should have had his back, the same people that should have been encouraging him in the faith, drug him out and stoned him. But he said, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Acts chapter seven, verse 60. That's mercy. That is kindness. That is steadfast love. That is what God desires for us to be like him, for us to be like Jesus. For our God is a God of love and of mercy. Sometimes, even as Christians, we don't hope for the best for people, especially those who have hurt us, especially those who have caused us some sort of pain. And the deeper the pain, the more we do not want good things for that person. Sometimes it's our politician. Well, who am I fooling? A lot of the times it is our politicians who we are angry and upset with because they're not looking out for our best interests. We voted them in, but we voted them to do the fair thing for us, the right thing for us, to look out for our best interests. Yet, that's not what they're doing. They seem to be working against us. They seem to be working for themselves. They seem to be doing the will of the elites. It hurts to think that those who are supposed to be looking up for our best interests, those who are supposed to be standing up for us, have backstabbed us, have double-crossed us, have smashed our faces in the dirt. Whenever they get a little taste of power, whenever they get a little taste of riches, of wealth, they gravitate to that. Yet Jesus said that we are to show them mercy. We are to pray for them. Do you know why? Because 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 tells us, it is not God's desire that anyone should perish, but all, every single soul, every one of us comes to the understanding that we all need a savior and that he, Jesus Christ, the son of the living God is the only savior. It is only by his name and his name alone that we are saved. And we have to accept him as Lord and savior in order to gain eternal life. For he alone has the words of life. He wants us to be where he is. He wants us to take him as Lord and Savior that he might save us and give us eternal life. Thus Peter warns us in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 14 through 15. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent 
to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him. There is nothing more important than to chase after salvation and to receive a double portion of it. Because all of life, the scripture says, what will it gain a man? Or what will it profit a man? if he gained the whole world and lose his soul. And again, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Your soul will live somewhere forever. This little temporal time, even if you live to be 102, what is that compared to all eternity? Choose Jesus, no matter how rough the life. No matter how much you have to suffer, choose life. Eternity is a long, long time. Because if you do not choose Jesus, the alternative is not so attractive. For everyone who rejects Jesus, rejects the Father. If we reject the Son and we reject the Father, there is now no hope left for us because all hope is wrapped up in the love and in the name of the Son, who by his own blood shed on Calvary's cross has purchased souls of man for the Father and has given us the power to be called sons and daughters of God Most High, John chapter one, verse 12. But if we reject that love, if we reject that free gift of salvation, there's only one alternative left for us. And the book of Hebrews declares this, that if we continue sinning deliberately, without regard to Jesus, without regard to his blood that he has shed as a sacrifice, then there is no more sacrifice left for us and for our sins, since we trampled on the blood of Jesus. We trampled his blood underfoot because it tells us that the only thing now that remains is a fearful expectation of judgment and the certainty of the fury of the fire that will consume all the adversaries of God. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 26 through 28. And what does the judgment look like? You might ask. Or what does Jesus look like? Well, according to Revelation chapter 1, verse 13 through 16, Revelation chapter 2, verse 18, and Revelation chapter 19, verse 11 through 16, Jesus looks like a son of man, clothed with a long robe with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head are white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes are like a flame of fire. His feet are like burnished bronze refined in a furnace. His voice is like the roar of many waters. He holds the seven stars in his right hand. His face is like the sun shining in its full strength. He has a sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth with which to strike down the nations. On his head are many diadems and he will rule the nations with an iron rod. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he is called Faithful and True. And he is also called the Word of God. He also has a name written that no one knows but he himself. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. The armies of heaven are arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, and they follow him on white horses. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God, God the Almighty. Jesus will not be coming back 
as a helpless baby born in a manger, dependent on earthly parents to protect him and to care for him. He is coming back as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the commander in chief of the armies of heaven, and no one will be able to withstand him. No one will be able to usurp his throne, for no one will be able to make war against him. Just the breath of his mouth will smite the nations. Are you ready for that day? Do you know him? Have you accepted the mercies of Almighty God? Jesus desires to show you mercy. Think about this for a moment. Does your religion or your atheism offer you mercy? Does your religion offer you steadfast love? Does your religion in, offer you an enduring love? A love that is so unsearchable, you cannot even begin to understand its depth. Think about this next. How do you receive the assurance that you will go to heaven after judgment? Do you know that you will spend eternity one place or the other place? Do you know that you're going to the good place? Think about it. Do you know that you know that you know that you're saved? Does your current religion give you that surety, that certainty? If not, Jesus, the judge of the whole world, can give you that peace. Why? Because he was the one who died for you. He was the one who died for me. He's the one who died for the whole world, for whomsoever will let him come. And Jesus will in no way turn him away. It is he, Jesus Christ, to whom you and I will have to give an account in that great day of judgment. And now this, know this, that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. There has to be a blood sacrifice. And Jesus is that blood sacrifice, the only blood sacrifice the only acceptable blood sacrifice. So Jesus would rather show you mercy than to extend judgment to you. He, he, he desired that so strongly that he himself suffered the judgment, the punishment of sin for you. He loved you that much for me. He loved me that much. So if you would like to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior today, all you have to do is to ask him. He will not turn you away. He will not embarrass you. But he will extend to you life. His arms are open, waiting for you to come. Come to the Father. He offers life, eternal life. And no one can take that life from you. They can kill the body but they cannot kill the soul. It's only God, Almighty God, who can kill the body and the soul. For he has the power to throw the soul into hell after the body is dead. So come to him. Let him rejuvenate you. Let him give you life and life more abundantly. So if you would like to accept that life from Jesus, if you would like to accept his salvation, Here's how you do it. Repeat this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. In the past, I have doubted you. In the past, I have rejected you. But now, I come to you. And I humbly ask for your forgiveness. Help me to live for you. Help me to know you, to draw close to you. And 
and I accept your free gift of salvation now. For it's in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. I can't tell you how important it is to begin to start to read and study your Bible. It's how we get to know who Jesus is, is how we draw close to him through prayer, through worship, through meditation on his word, what he's saying to us. Get a good Bible, a Bible you can understand and read that Bible every single day. Study it, draw close to him, pray. You gotta pray. Then you got to find a Bible-believing church who still believes in the power of the Holy Spirit, who still believes that there's a God who says there's a right way and a wrong way to live. Join that church. Be discipled in that church. And when Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing what it is you should be doing. He'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter in to the joy of the Lord. And there we will be, there you will be, there whoever else that accepts Jesus as Lord and Savior will be, will be with him forever and ever and ever, throughout all eternity, while those who have rejected him are in punishment, eternal punishment in a lake of fire. Choose wisely this day whom you will serve. I say, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Will you do it as well? Just ask him. And if you have, know that God loves you. Know that Jesus loves you. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.